Friends, grace and peace to you in the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at Front Street United Methodist Church. I'm Patrick, this is Ross. Together we pastor this congregation uh, and serve in this uh, awesome community that we live in. We're glad that you're with us today. If this is your first time with us, we are uh, delighted that you've chosen to worship with our family today. And we pray that that would become a regular rhythm for your life. And that uh, in our joined worship today, you would encounter the living God in Jesus Christ. Uh, again, welcome to all of you. We're glad to be together, even if virtually. Uh, you'll find in your order of service our opening prayer. If you would please join me as we pray. Almighty God, who created us in your own image, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom. Help us to employ it in the work of justice in our communities and among the nations, to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is Children of the Heavenly Father. Let us sing together. First scripture for the day is from Psalm 86, the first two verses and then verses 15 through 17. Incline your ear, Lord, and answer me, for lowly and needy am I. Guard my life, for I am faithful. Rescue your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. You, O Lord, are a merciful, gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast kindness. Turn to me and grant me peace. Give your strength to your servant and rescue your handmaiden's son. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see me and be shamed. For you, Lord, have helped me and consoled me. 
And this reading from the book of Genesis, picking up from last week. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son, whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly, because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation, also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bowshot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And she sat there. She began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Good morning, friends. Welcome to the children's sermon. Let me introduce myself again. My name is Sarah, and I am married to Abraham. Abraham and I had a son at a very old age, and his name was Isaac. Well, I didn't mention last week that Abraham had another son and his name was Ishmael. Abraham had him with another woman named Hagar, and Hagar was one of my servants. Well, I was very jealous over them. I just got so upset. Ishmael, he grew up to be a very tall, good-looking boy, and it just made me so jealous. It made me do something really mean. See, I was jealous because I was scared that Ishmael would inherit Abraham's things when Abraham was to die. And I did not want him to share with my son Isaac. I wanted my son Isaac to get it all. Well, let me tell you a little bit about jealousy. Jealousy sometimes makes you do mean things. Suppose your friend had a toy that you really wanted to play with and you went and just took it away. Or what if your friend had many, many things that you didn't have and it made you a little jealous and made you do something mean? Well, that's what I did. I told Abraham that I wanted him to take Ishmael and Hagar into the desert and drop them off so that they would never come back again. Well, Abraham did exactly what I asked him to do. He took them to the desert, gave them one flask of water and a loaf of bread and left them there. Well, eventually the water ran out and the bread and Ishmael got very, very hungry and very, very weak and very thirsty, that his mother got scared. She was scared that her son was gonna die. So she went off to the side and she cried out to God, God, please hear my prayer. And God did hear her prayer. He called out from heaven and told her, don't be afraid. The Lord has heard your son crying. Lift him up and take his hand. For I am going to make your son Ishmael 
into a great nation. And God did exactly what he said he was going to do. So Hagar, she turned around and she saw a well. A well is full of water. So she gathered up water and she carried it to her son and she washed his face and gave him something to drink. And that water made him strong. And he grew up to be a great, strong, handsome man and married a, a woman from Egypt and had lots and lots of children. And he was a father of a great nation. Well, friends, the next time you feel jealousy, let it turn into a good thing. Make you call out to God and ask God to give you strength. And maybe you'll do something kind instead of something mean. Let us pray. Dear God, we know that you love us and you love us even when we do bad things or we make mistakes. We want to thank you. Amen. I want to wish all those dads out there a happy Father's Day. And I'll see you next week. Love you. See you real soon. Bye. In reading this story this week, I was, I'm always looking for artwork that we might use to depict the scriptures that we're using, just like we would a normal bulletin where we were not in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm amazed, or this week particularly, I was amazed at the sheer number of paintings that depict this particular passage from Genesis about Hagar and Ishmael and their fate. And I began to think about just that number of pieces of artwork based on this scripture and how that almost begs the question of what about this story is it that captures uh, the imagination of our faith uh, such that we would want to visualize what is happening within it. I read this and I see the story of a sundered family. Um, Abraham and Sarah in their history with God have become God's covenant partners and God promises to make a great nation through uh, their offspring. And this is a family that's going to be bigger than our conception of family, it's a, it's a family that's going to be as innumerable as the grains of sand and the stars in the sky. And they will be, as God says, a people through whom God will extend blessing to the world. And the birth of Isaac, which happens just before this, is the fulfillment of all those promises. It's the resolution of all of Abraham and Sarah's anguish um, that they've experienced in their old age and waiting for God to make good on that promise. And in the midst of that lies a problem. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. prior to the fulfillment of that promise in Isaac's birth, uh, there was some scheming that went on uh, between Abraham and Sarah and their slave girl in their household named Hagar. And through her, with her at Sarah's request, Abraham um, and her have relations and she bears a son and he is named Ishmael. And so we have this moment in Scripture this morning where a family is sundered uh, for various reasons, and it's a challenge to us to find God and what God is up to in the midst of all of this turmoil and the inability to see God's favor and grace resting on every member of that family. Yeah, that's a uh, nice summary. <laughs> uh, yeah, what, what is it that causes, uh, you know, uh, I'll go back to your, your original question that yeah. you were asking yourself. What about this story causes us to want to, or, or people down through history, to want to depict it uh, in pictures? I mean, uh, there, there are a lot out there. I looked myself, and, and there are a lot. There's, I mean, 
there's a lot of pictures of obviously or paintings of of, of Jesus on the cross, mm-hmm. um, of of his birth, and there's also a lot of of this. And I think one of the things that we as people recognize is when when something is done wrongly. Mm. Um, you know, Walter Walter Brueggemann. Uh, Old Testament scholar, I yeah, think you brought him, him up yeah, a week or two him. ago. Uh, he wrote that Ishmael is the product of human design and planning. Isaac is the product of pure miracle, God's intervention and wonder. And to live in a world purely by our own devices might be appealing in the culture of the self-made man, but it runs contrary to the gospel story of allowing God's grace to be the driving force of life. And I think one of the things that this story reminds us is this tension between our failure and God's grace. Hmm. Um, we, we strive, we, we lift up Abraham as this, this paragon of, of faith. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, he's in Hebrews in the, in the, the hall of faith. If you, I, I'm sorry for doing that. Um, <laughs> that little air quotes, I repent of that. Um, but he's in the in the hall of faith, and 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 as as you mentioned when we were talking before the service, uh, he does have great moments of faith, but he also has great moments when he falls on his face. Oh yeah. Um, if you think back to when when he and Sarah were going to into Egypt, and he was scared for his own life, mm-hmm. wasn't really worried about Sarah. Yeah. Um, but he's scared for his own life. And so he says, pretend you're my sister. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, uh, Pharaoh f- finds favor uh, in her and, and brings her into his harem, if you will. And uh, one of the rabbinic traditions says that's where Hagar came from, is that Hagar was one of Pharaoh's daughters and he gave his daughter to to uh, Sarah because she had found so much favor with him, uh, was so beautiful, Hmm. and um, said, I would rather for my daughter to be the servant of this person than to be a slave in in someone else's house. Um, And uh, so, you know, rabbinic tradition holds that Hagar even came into their lives as a result of Abraham's not trusting in God, his scheming, Mm -hmm. in other words. Yeah. whether it's true or not, it's a it's an interesting conjecture, an interesting story. Uh, but yeah, all of this, the Hagar perhaps coming into their lives, uh, 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 Ishmael being born at all, um, is is a, I'm not going to put it all on Sarah right now because I want to I want to fuss about uh, uh, <laughs> Abraham right um, right first. Because, uh, I mean, in, in that time period, it was unabashedly a patriarchal society. Mm-hmm. And he should have been standing up as the person leading his, his family toward God. Mm-hmm. But he kept thinking of himself, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, because... It, Sarah, Sarah says, here, take my, my servant Hagar, mm-hmm. and he goes, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, instead yeah. of saying, no, we need to trust and we need to have patience with God, you know. Yeah, he, 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 I think Abraham does model disbelief a lot of times, and Sarah does well, and I think that Abraham clearly denigrates Sarah by the way that he uses her towards his own ends for his own personal sake. Yeah, yeah. And, and here we have in Hagar a person whose body is commodified um, as property, you know, as, yeah. as a slave. And, you know, she, she becomes a concubine. Um, and Sarah becomes unable to view Hagar as a person. She sees her as Egyptian, as other, a foreigner, as someone outside of the covenant, as someone who is nothing more than a concubine, a slave. And um, well, and even even more than that, she gets to the point she's she is so upset about the relationship 
as, as I view it, the mm -hmm. relationship between Hagar and her, her husband mm -hmm. and this child and her husband, mm -hmm. that she, she seems to forget her role in facilitating that relationship. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's like a, it's a monstrosity of her own design, so to speak. And, and it's, um, and so, yeah, she notices that, you know, Ishmael, who's considerably older than Isaac, after they've kind of grown some, is um, they're outside. And, and the Hebrew verb there is, it says, some translations say play, others say that he was laughing or, or mocking. And, it, Sarah, it's supposed to be a play on, on Isaac's name. Right, on Isaac's name, which is, yeah, yeah he will laugh is what right. Isaac's name means. And, um, and it seems that whenever, whatever Sarah beholds there, she sees in that um, almost as if Ishmael is trying to, um, is in competition with Isaac, that he's seeking to supplant or has a, he has a legitimate claim to any kind of inheritance or authority that might come and be passed from Abraham. And, um, and really, literally, it's like almost like the text says there, and Ishmael was Isaacing Isaac. This is right. basically what the yeah. Hebrew says. He was like, you know, mocking, almost like Sarah perceived it as Ishmael trying to imitate who Isaac was supposed to be or meant to be. Right. Um, and as he, you know, he would be the child of laughter versus Isaac, so to speak. And so right. um, Sarah, Sarah goes to Abraham and she says, hey, drive them out. Mm -hmm. Drive them out. And, and you notice here, like, you're, when you're mad with somebody, you know how like, you can't even say their name? Right. Like, yeah, somebody, she didn't even say it. Yeah. yeah, it's like a, a couple gets divorced, something like that. They always say, my ex. They never say them, call them by the name, right? Here she says, right. drive out this slave girl and her son. Right. Doesn't even allow Abraham any kind of... Relationship. Just, yeah. just, drive out this slave woman and her son. And in, in her plotting, she's trying to remove them from the picture altogether because of her own because her own scheming, in a way, has come back to haunt her. And, and what happens here is that this family is divided into winners and losers, superiors and inferiors, insiders and outsiders. And mm -hmm. uh, this is precisely what sin does in the human family. Yeah. It makes us into, I mean, and, and we see this happen uh, today in terms, I mean, attach any ism to it, you know, sexism, ageism, racism, all these things that are going on. Um, even our politics and our denominational stuff, like we winners, losers, insiders, outsiders, superiors, inferiors. Um, and, and here we have that happening within the context of a family in which God has decided that the nations of the world would be blessed. Right. Um, and, and it gets back to almost Brueggemann's thing of, 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 as human beings, we can lay down plans, but they they end up negating God's grace yeah. that was intended to, to be for everyone in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, that, as, he, as he said, back to the old gospel message, mm -hmm. uh, that Jesus came to die for everyone, mm -hmm. that, wishes, uh, that none should perish, but that all should be saved. And um, God can even, I, th I think we may have even said this last week, God can redeem our unfaithfulness mm -hmm. if we will allow it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Abraham, uh, again, I'm going to get down on him. I tend to be harder on men than, uh, because I think men should know better. Uh, and sometimes we, we know and we still don't do what we think we, what we know <laughs> we should do. Um, but uh, not that women don't, but I can't speak toward women because I'm not one. But uh, if we would just allow God's grace to work in the lives of other people the way that we want it to work in our own life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and not say to, to some other person and, and try to remove ourselves from even any responsibility for it right. uh, by saying, you take care of them. Uh, mm -hmm. get them out of here. I don't want to see them anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it myself, but I want you we to We want to stay go comfortable. Do it. We don't want to be realized that, and yeah. somehow we're all connected and what we do affects yeah. one another. But I want to get my yeah. hands dirty yeah. in, in the process. And, so. and we, I think we tend to, and, and along with that, and we talked about this uh, earlier this week, is that we tend to view God's economy like a pie. Yeah. Like if, if for whatever reason it, se it feels like you're getting a bigger slice, that makes me circle my wagons because I feel, I'm afraid that what happens by you 
receiving something means that I'm somehow going to get less. Right. And that's, that's scarcity. That's not the abundance of God. And we do that with each other in, in kind of how we view, uh, again, how we view one another as children of God or not. Uh, we think that because, you know, that this group needs more attention and more love and more grace and more forgiveness or more justice, then that somehow leads us to believe that I'm going to get slighted. That I'm going to get slighted. There's going to be less for me. But that's not how it works. It's not pie. This is this is this is the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And if that is, I mean, if that is the scope of God's power and God's mercy for us, then holy moly, how how much are we reducing God's ability to act in our lives yeah. by by being so petty about? You know, maybe you do need more grace in me in a given moment, or maybe I need um, God to enact justice in my behalf in a moment more than in your life. But that doesn't mean that that same thing wouldn't be available to you. Right. Yeah. Um, we cheapen grace. We do. We do. And and God is a God of abundance, not just in the way we sometimes talk about it in in stewardship sermons, but <laughs> yeah. but uh, both and but yeah, both and. <laughs> uh, God's grace is abundant as well, but there's nothing we can do that can diminish God's grace. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, you know, yes, I've been and trouncing down kind of hard on, on Abraham, but on the, on the flip side of that, I like that Abraham is this way because I can identify with him more. Yeah. He's a human being. He's, he's not a, human a being. he's yes. not a, 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 um, this immaculate, Kind of model of faith. unreachable, yeah. yes. No, uh, know. You know, uh, I, I like that Abraham is flawed. I like that David is flawed. I like that Paul uh, talks about that. Sometimes I do the things that, that I, I don't want to do, yeah. that I know I shouldn't do. The very thing and, I want to do, I don't do. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. very thing I don't want to do, I, I, I can't seem to do it. Um, I like that there are characters in the Bible that are real that mm-hmm. I can identify with, and that I see how God. Used them anyway. God acted through them, uh, in them, on their behalf, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so God doesn't require any of us to be perfect paragons of virtue. Um, he He requires us to be obedient, mm-hmm. to show up for each other right. and for Him, and. You know, it's it's when we make ourselves available that he can work through us. It's when we decide that we're going to hold back. I'm I'm just going to take my piece of the pie and go home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and, I've, and I've, I've 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 got my God. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got my salvation. I've got mm-hmm. my whatever, mm-hmm. and I'm going to take that and I'm just going to go hunker down. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I I think the. The God, the way, the way I kind of understand God is if I'm going to stay in the game, he keeps giving me more and more of, his, of himself. Um, he will allow me to take the, the finite amount of himself that I've gotten at one point and go off by myself. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm robbing myself of even more of God's presence in my yeah. life. And I, I think, I in, a, in essence, I think that's kind of what Sarah and Abraham both do in this situation. And, you know, Abraham's just kind of like stupefied by the whole thing. Uh, and, and, you know, God makes it clear, like, yes, the promise is going to issue through Isaac because that's the way I, what forward, I foreordained it. Yeah. But I'm not going to forget Ishmael. Right. Believe me, like, you guys have the issue here. I don't have an issue with Hagar and Ishmael. They're my children, too. I love them. And so... God refuses to let the other son uh, be dismissed from the family, so to speak, God's mm-hmm. family, if you're thinking about it. It's, and it, when I was reading this, I thought about the parable of the prodigal son a little bit, and that like, mm-hmm. at the end of that, both of the sons real, have to realize that they've always belonged to the father, the one who went off and destroyed everything, and then the one who thought that because he was good, he deserved everything. Right. Um, both the belonging, belonging to their father was their natural state. Um, and, and so here, like regardless of how Sarah and Abraham respond to Hagar and Ishmael, God doesn't allow them ultimately to be cast out. They're still part of what God is doing, and God takes right. care of them. And so he says, Abraham is like, I got this. Don't worry. Like, I'll take care of it. Y'all can't do it. 
So I'm going to take care right. of it, you know. And it is part um, of the human condition to mm -hmm. to be uh, self-centered, whatever. I mean, okay. So we we know uh, from the larger picture today, uh, tradition holds obviously that through Isaac came uh, the the Jewish lineage and um, and, and Israel, uh, and and then through uh, Ishmael. Uh, is, goes down through uh, what uh, Esau marries in there. Uh, and so the Arab world mm -hmm. comes through Ishmael. Mm -hmm. So even, even today, mm -hmm. in the year 2020, this is 2020. Yeah. Uh, in the year 2020, we've still got the descendants of these two at odds sure. in Israel and the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, each of them looking for their piece of the pie. Uh, if, if they would allow, and, and I'm not really interested in where people come down on politically the whole Israel-Palestinian thing. My interest lies more in if, if, if we could just get everybody to see that the other one is, as you said, uh, just as much a recipient of God's grace just as much a a child of the father as the other mm -hmm. that they have that in common right. um, then maybe they could sit down if they could see each other spiritually for mm -hmm. who they are first and then yeah I, I maybe think it's, the, the the humanity stuff might have something to to work with yeah i've I've been stewing over and i've I've mentioned it a number of times, but it's just because i'm it's just something that won't let me go that that Bonhoeffer quota we have to learn to uh, view people in light of what they suffer more than in light of what they do and don't do mm -hmm. and I think that's like what what's happening the sundering of this family is is the refusal to view each other in, in light of what what they have suffered what pain is there what what God is doing to reconcile that i mean like because Hagar, Hagar and Ishmael have to go out. I mean, they're gone. They're out in the wilderness of Beersheba. They're, they're wandering in the wilderness. The water gives out. Mm -hmm. Hagar doesn't want to watch her son die. Like, I mean, I, I think about it. I've been out in the deserts in, in Arizona and in Mexico and seen where, like, migrants walk along those trails. I, I couldn't imagine what it would be like for, for a mother to have to, to set, her, set her child down under, like, a, a, a measly bush and walk away and just, and just weep because you know there's just nothing that's going to save you from, from the disaster that's coming. And in, in the middle of that, uh, that weeping, that's when God shows up mm -hmm. for them, just kind of, and, and God's messenger. I thought it was interesting. God's messenger doesn't hear Hagar crying. It says God's messenger hears Ishmael. Yes, God, God, God heard the cry of the boy. And, and that's like, that's Ishmael's huh. name. That's a callback to his name. It means God. God, God will hear. hears. God will yeah. hear. Yeah, is what Ishmael means. And so, um, God hears Ishmael's cry and comes to Hagar in the form of an angel and says, under the pitiful shade of that desert shrub, and says, "Look, um, we hear. I hear you. You're not. You're not going to be abandoned. Um, you're not going to be dismissed. Um, he will be taken care of. You will be taken care of." And, and that promise that God gives to Hagar and Ishmael is a promise that God's going to remember all of God's children. Just like I think, you know, a, a mother, I think about, like, my great-grandparents, um, maybe your grandparents or great-grandparents who had, like, tons of kids in, the, in their family and have to remember all their names, but a mother <laughs> or a father knows each one of their names, knows everything about them from the tips of their head to the tips of their toes, uh, everything from their failures to their successes and, their, and all those things. Uh, and, and God moves and knows those things and moves to care for them. God provides, shows that by providing a well of water for them and then making the promise that things are going to turn out okay. It takes away from her the need to fear for the future. Right. Um, so if you had, if you had um, one point that you would want folks to take away from this, this part of this larger story, what would it be? I think that God refuses to abandon any of us and that God, uh, even when we miss things and want to stay comfortable and see things only through our own eyes, God moves with grace and mercy towards those who are suffering and who need it the most. And uh, I think it's really important for us to remember too that later 
A couple of chapters later, Sarah dies, and then Abraham dies. Mm-hmm. And when Abraham dies, who comes to bury him? These two come Isaac, back together. Isaac and Ishmael, yeah. they come together to bury their father. That's um, right. And so a sundered family perhaps finds some hope of reconciliation. It's great. In the next generation. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, as we continue to worship, uh, we give thanks that God's grace is abundant and it is sufficient for all of us. And so let's uh, give thanks for that as we return to God, his tithes and our gifts and offerings. Uh, Please feel free at this point to uh, text your offering in or uh, run, get an envelope and and put your offering in the envelope and, and address it or go online and uh, go to the church website and hit that gift tab. Uh, we, we would love for you to do that and are grateful for all of those uh, uh, who are at home worshiping who continue to support the ministries of Front Street. Thank you for being part of that faithfulness.
morning, let us join together confessing what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we confess that we are no better than Abraham or Sarah. We're no better than David. We're no better than Paul or Peter or any of those characters that we find uh, who are people that you have called into your service and into your life in the Bible. And in one way, we, we do need to confess our shortcomings. We confess that we are sometimes unfaithful. We, are con uh, we confess that we sometimes find our own plans more attractive or more realistic or more doable or even just more at hand than yours. We confess that we sometimes are not patient enough for your timing and we want to force things. That if we would just trust in your wisdom, in your time, in your grace, in your abundant love, in your provision, in your plan, that our lives would turn out a lot better. Our relationships in the world would be better. Our relations uh, amongst people that we, we know and we like and that are even like us uh, would be better in people, uh, relations with people who think differently than us and uh, look different than us and talk different than us would be better if we would just realize that we are all just recipients of your grace, none better, none worse than the other. We all stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. If we could just remember to look at the person next to us and say thank you for the privilege of being next to you as we both stand in front of God. Wow, what a world we would live in. We pray today, Lord, that you would help us to move, even if it's just in baby steps, toward that reality a little more. Help us to remember that others deserve a place in the world just as much as we do, maybe even more. Help us to be humble in our own minds as we think about ourselves so that we might be able to lift one another up. 
We pray for our leaders in this country. We pray for our president. We pray for the vice president. We pray for senators and for representatives in Congress. We pray for those who sit on the benches of justice in uh, the Supreme Court. We pray for wisdom for all of them. We pray for our governor and for our lieutenant governor and all of those in the legislature and all of those who sit on the North Carolina Supreme Court. We pray again for their wisdom that it would come from you, that they wouldn't seek to, to make their service political, but it might be an opportunity for self-giving. We pray for all of those who are leaders in our own community. We pray for leaders in our church, that they might lead us more fully into your presence and might lead us into more uh, or, or deeper lives of discipleship. We pray for our own church, for the members of the church, for those who visit for those who might just walk through the door looking for someone to talk to, we lift them up. And we're grateful for one another. Lord, hear our prayers. As we pray for those who are sick, those who are grieving, and as we give thanks for the blessings in our lives. Hear our prayer, Lord. And hear our voices and our hearts as we join them together, praying the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our closing hymn is, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Let us sing together. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and grant us peace now and always. We, we go, go in peace, peace to, to love and, and serve, serve the Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.